This is the Leeds Business Podcast, and I'm your host, Phil Fraser. I'm a business sounding board. Think somewhere between a business coach and a business mentor. If you're a business owner feeling the pain and confusion of being lonely at the top, drop me an email. I can help you. In this week's episode, we speak to Chris Bax, co-owner of Bax Botanics. Chris tells us all about how the self-confessed professional tree-hugging husband and wife team launched an outdoor experiential business. He shares with us how he failed to recognize a customer who was a major Hollywood movie and TV star, how they finally landed on botanics as a business, and you get to meet Ebenezer, Edith, and Hefzibar. Plus, Chris teaches us all about how to export your product. To make sure you never miss out on every episode of the Leeds Business Podcast, sign up to our priority list at www.leedsbusinesspodcast.com. Everyone that signs up gets a free gift to help their business. So, let's get into what is a really fascinating interview. My guest on today's show is Chris Bax of Bax Botanics. Chris, good afternoon. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much for having me here. Good. Great. Great to see you. Um, let's just start with... Give our guests a very, very brief explanation of what Bax Botanics is, and then we'll go back to the start of the of the business journey. Yeah, sure. So uh, as Bax Botanics, we um, create and manufacture um, adult alcohol-free drinks. So I suppose the, um, the, the words coined for it are alcohol-free spirits because we use distillation to, um, to create the drinks, but they're a grown-up drink um that doesn't have alcohol uh so we 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 manufacture those and then sell those so chris before we came online you were telling me where your career started so you're you're distilling alcohol free drinks now you started life as a 3d designer tell tell us how that all got started uh well 3d designer basically came from um i suppose going through school and then further education and being very much into the sort of creative side of things. Um, but then I kind of, um, I was working in London in the eighties as a, as a lighting designer and, uh, I quite liked the business, but, uh, I didn't really quite fit in with the kind of, um, that eighties culture of, um, consumption and, you know, all those sort of things. And I also used to spend, uh, a lot of time thinking about what I was going to eat and also about what I was going to cook. And uh, eventually I I left the world of design behind and went into the world of food. Another creative, you know, another creative profession, but um, uh, I decided to take the sort of passion project I had going with, uh, you know, what I cooked for dinner. I'd spend half the day thinking about what I was going to cook when I got home. So I thought, well, why not turn it on its head and, and actually work doing that? Um, so yeah, then worked as uh, as a chef for a number of years um, until I met my wife Rose. Okay, so did you did you train as a chef or did you just throw yourself into it? How did you how did you make that switch? I didn't. I was um, so uh, when I made that switch, uh, I did a I did a short course, which I'd say didn't prepare me for the um, incredible stressful <laughs> life in a kitchen. But um, I was very lucky to find a a good chef um, who had been one of the original judges on uh, MasterChef when it was the old school, when it was Lloyd Grossman and all that. He'd been a um, he'd been a, a judge on that and had a bit more respect for the kind of enthusiastic amateur, I guess. And um, he um, his name was John Benson Smith, um, who was you know pretty famous in the in the nineties. Um, has moved on to consultancy and does all the, f the food consultancy for big football stadiums now and stuff. But at the time, he was a restaurant chef and he said, well, I'll tell you what, come and work for me for a month. If you can hack it, you can stay. And if you can't hack it, we'll say goodbye. And I hacked it and uh, I, I worked for him uh, for a number of years. And then um, I suppose because I was a little bit older than a lot of people doing what I was doing, we, we, I ended up taking on and having my own business with another chef and we, uh, we sort of went forward with that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my, how I transferred from design into chefing. And as I say, didn't, didn't actually train, but, um, trained on the job, uh, thanks to a very understanding, uh, you know, head chef. 
Okay. Okay. So what was, uh, what was setting up your own restaurant like? So I was with somebody, uh, I, I joined forces with a chef who had a bit more experience than me. Um, and so, um, I suppose I was always the kind of, he was very much the driver as far as the actual kitchen was concerned. Although I worked in the kitchen, um, I tend to do more of the kind of, um, the business side of it. Um, and, um, that, uh, that was fairly natural to me, really. Um, I, um, I had kind of basic understanding of, of doing those things. And, um, and so, yeah, it was, it was good. It was a good few years. Um, and I honestly thought I would probably still be doing it now. Um, and if, if things hadn't kind of changed um, 25 years ago, I think I probably would be, you know, still working as a chef now. But uh, as it was, um, fate uh, fate came along and uh, changed the the path again okay so uh tell us about tell us about fate what happened i was in a uh, partnership with this um other chef and um we decided probably um we hadn't fallen out but we thought we might fall out if we kept on working together so we decided to go our different ways and we sold the business and um I, uh, my other big love right the way through from being a teenager is the outdoors and mountaineering. So once we told that business, I went over to the Himalayas for three months to do some climbing. And when I came back, um, I intended to go straight back into chefing, um, signed up with a temp agency in the short term, and they sent me off to a job to take over a head chef job in Harrogate. And when I got there, um, they said, oh, I'm really sorry. The agency should have told you. Um, we promoted somebody internally for the, the two weeks rather than taking you on. So slightly de dejected, I went um, to do some retail, to do some retail therapy, actually. It was, uh, I had just come back from climbing and I went to an outdoor shop just to sort of see if I could see something and just mooch around this outdoor shop and, uh, and uh met my wife <laughs> uh, in that moment of going into that shop and um and my now wife um and uh we she'd she'd changed uh, careers from advertising and gone to work in an outdoor shop because she thought it might be nice they had a sign on the door saying part-time staff required i thought that might, might be quite nice and um we started going out about three or four weeks later and we've barely been apart since so um yeah that was the major change and uh and then from going climbing and walking together um rose is a plant expert and she was teaching me about wildflowers and uh because i think quite a lot with my stomach i one day said they're really pretty rose but can i eat them and she said, I don't know, let's find out. <laughs> and so we started a journey researching wild herbs, mushrooms, seaweeds, plants, all sorts of, you know, roots, berries, everything. And it was like, you know, with for a, like a cook's brain, it was like someone had just opened up a whole new cupboard of ingredients. And so um, for our own uh, in, interest, we basically did that for uh, a couple of years um at the time we were living in a very pretty rented cottage and we thought we ought to put some money into it so into something sorry not into the cottage but uh as we're both a couple of tree huggers we bought 18 acres of woodland um with a mortgage from the ecology building society and uh rose at the time was doing some chainsaw carving i was doing the outdoor cooking and the foraging and she was doing that along with me and one day somebody said will you will you teach us how to do that and I said yes, and that actually grew into a business which is is still going and runs alongside Bax Botanics. It's called Taste the Wild, and we still teach about um, wild herbs, mushrooms, um, all all the things you can find in the wild that you can that you can cook. We also do cooking over a, an open fire and bread baking in log fired ovens and all sorts of stuff, stuff like that. And I have other instructors now who who deal with that for me and we we just we make the odd um appearance from time to time um but it was through that that kind of things led on to bax botanics um and the drinks we do um 
I've always been a believer that if you're teaching about something, it's really good to give people um, very good examples. So it's very easy for me to hold a belief and say, oh, you can eat this, it tastes great. But unless I show you what you can do with it and how great it can taste, then it's a bit, it's a bit abstract, it's a bit irrelevant. So we always used to make lots of products to show off these wild ingredients. Um, and through that, we, we got to be consultants to the food industry, to various gin manufacturers and uh, restaurants and all sorts of places. Um, and constantly people asked us, well, we, we give them these things to show them how good our wild ingredients could be. And they'd say, well, can we buy these things? And we'd be like, no, no, we're, we're here to inspire people. We're teachers, we're not manufacturers. Um, and that went on for a little while. We, and we could never find a product which felt right at the right time. And also one that we could do sustainably. Because uh, as I say, we, we are kind of, we are a couple of tree huggers and we had to kind of, if we were gonna do something, we had to think of a way that it would work and we wouldn't be going out and, you know, robbing the wild of all its, uh, all, all of its lovely wild ingredients. So um, anyway, eventually uh, in 2018, early 2018, um, we were playing about with um, with alcohol-free distillation. So to create a create a, a really interesting gin-like drink, but with no alcohol, so water distillation. Uh, and it was something that we'd we'd done over the years with um, different blossoms and herbs. Um, and we thought maybe we could create a drink because where we live, we live in the middle of nowhere, and one of us always has had to to um, drive. So there was always that designated driver and we really felt that they had, um, they got the short straw really when it came to um, to drinks. You know, you'd go out into a local pub and there'd be great beer on, there'd be great a wine list, there'd be a broad range of gins. But then you said you were driving and you got, you know, a very uh, depleted list of things. So we thought well, we'd give it a go using all our knowledge of herbs and herbal flavors and distillation to try and create something for the adults. Um, and in order to do it sustainably, rather than doing it from the wild, we found a supplier that could spy us organic fair trade herbs. Um, and uh, yeah, that was kind of the early stages of Bax Botanics and the planning for Bax Botanics. Amazing, amazing. But before we get onto that, you've, you've sort of, You've dropped in <laughs> this big chunk of taste the wild. So, so just talk us through what does that look like as a as a as a product? What's it like as a product offering? What does the consumer see? How does yeah? Just talk us through that as a business. Absolutely, yeah. So it's a, it's very much um, um, a an experiential business. So we we have this uh, woodland that we this eighteen acre woodland which we. Um, we bought uh, in 2004 um, and uh, now um, we've been managing it for all that time along with other people as well with help um, to produce a range of wild ingredients so we can teach you about a broad range of wild ingredients in, a, in an 18 acre woodland and it also has um, cooking facilities so we can cook over log fires and in log ovens um, so we can also teach people to cook and also make those ovens and, and, and do the different things in there. And they are small, uh, small courses. So depending on the course runs from sort of eight people up to 16 people, and they will come along to us for a day and they will learn a skill, whether that is, uh, foraging for mushrooms or foraging for, uh, plants, or, um, we also yeah, teach people how to build um, clay pizza ovens. Um, uh, so yeah, it's those sort of experiential um, courses. We were we we're incredibly lucky with that because we started in a, a very small way because somebody asked us to run a course and someone from The Guardian came unbeknownst to me, came on the first course. So a week after our first course, we had two pages in The Guardian uh, Saturday magazine um and uh we kind of didn't really look back from there to be honest <laughs> um a bit of luck there we had um so yeah it's grown um i have to say at the beginning i thought well this is this is lots of fun 
how many people can actually possibly want to do this? <laughs> and every year I kind of thought, well, you know, will anybody want to come next year? Um, but they do. And I think um, we, we kind of got busier and busier. I think scale back slightly when Rose and I stepped away to do Bax, Bax Botanics, but it still goes on. And, and it's amazing post COVID, how people now really value that experiential thing. They really uh, value being outdoors and enjoying the countryside. Um, so yeah, although our business closed down completely and utterly during, um, during that COVID lockdown, um, we kind of came out the other side. I mean, we're, we're a small business. We can be nimble and, and reel our horns in and, 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 weather that and we managed to do that and coming out the other side more people than ever want to get involved with that sort of thing so um yeah that's um that's a really nice sort of um it was the the main hustle it's kind of now the side hustle uh, and i i still love doing it i love talking to people about plants and cooking so i i go back and do that and we still work with various restaurants places like grantley hall and Swinton Park and, you know, places that are really interested in food. I go back and take the chefs out foraging and uh, and, and sort of pass on that knowledge to, to a great number of people. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, there, there will be a link um, in the show notes below if anybody wants to book for Taste the Wild. Yeah, sure. I mean, what sort of... Uh... What sort of guests do you have on these courses? So we run uh, we run a website where you can buy, you know, you could buy one person could just decide to come on their own or quite often it's, you know, two or three people will come together. Um, depending on the course, there's between eight and 16 people on it. Um, I like to keep the numbers quite small because I like to really engage with people. Um, but we also, yeah, we do corporate as well. Corporate has been, um, corporate has been quite quiet post covid um and but you know going back beforehand it was it was you know we had regular and interesting um corporate visitors uh, who would come along for the day um but yeah it's a it's a real broad range of clients we've had um yeah everything from you know local farmers to Hollywood actors, you know, I've taught, I've taught to all sorts of different people. You can't just, you can't, Chris, you can't just say Hollywood actors and they just let me expe expect me to carry on. Go on, name drop Hollywood actors. It's, it's a guy called. Um, he's not, a, not, a, he's not. A, well, he was a huge star um, in more in um, in TV, but he's in, been in a few movies as well. Uh, uh, and it was embarrassing because I was with him for the whole day, and then did that classic of what you what do you do for a living and he said an actor and I sort of said oh well, you know what sort of acting and he just said oh well I do a little bit of this and a little bit of that and I was he was very 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 uh, modest about it all and um I chatted to him would, would you have been in anything I've seen oh I might have been and all this and it was a guy called Michael McMahon who was is the son of the, an ex ex um prime minister of Australia he's married married to Danny Minogue um, he was at the time I met him, he was the highest paid TV actor in the world um, for a, a program called Nip Tuck. Um, and he was also Dr. Doctor Doom in the, um, what are they called? Uh, one of the Marvel movies anyway, Dr. Doom. So, um, yeah, so I spent all day sort of chatting to him. And then the person I was working with um, at the end of the day, I said, oh, he was an actor. And they were like, no kidding. And they know who he was the whole day. Um, and uh, were listening to me chat away and make an idiot of myself, laughing to themselves, knowing full well that he was, you know, this incredibly famous person. But I had no idea. Um, yeah, so his name's Michael McMahon. He's, he, was, he was, a yeah, as I say, at the time, the highest paid uh, TV actor in the world. That is absolutely brilliant. I used to watch Nip Tuck, so I know exactly oh, I who you mean. <laughs> that is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I love it. Love it. Love it. Before we get on to Bax Botanics, I just want to talk to everybody about the Leeds Business Podcast Fair Deal. The Leeds Business Podcast Fair Deal has two sides to it. My side of the fair deal is every week, totally free of charge, I bring you inspirational, fascinating and educational guests like Chris and his famous Hollywood friends. <laughs> you, Mr. and Mrs. Listener or viewer, your side of the deal has two parts to it. 
Part number one, I want you to recommend this podcast to one person that you feel will get benefit from it. And part number two, um, I want you to post a review either on the Apple Podcasts app or at podchaser.com or give us a thumbs up at Spotify. Or if you're watching on YouTube, give us a wave, Chris, for everybody who's on YouTube. Those who are listening, Chris is waving. He's, he's obviously been trained by a professional actor how to wave. If you're watching on YouTube, um, give this episode a thumbs up and give, it a, give us a positive comment as well. So that's the Leeds Business Podcast. There's the Leeds Business Podcast fair deal. Um, hopefully, Hollywood actors might even, might even give us a thumbs up. So um, we've talked about Taste the Wild. Um, you have decided or you've come across this idea of producer, you finally found the product you want, which is Bax Botanics. Talk us through what the product is and then talk us about how you actually make it. So the um, the product itself, itself is a, it's a botanical drink. The closest thing that it, it sort of emulates, I suppose, is a gin because it's a distilled product. Um, made from plant flavors uh, and if you think of a gin is juniper and often cardamom and lemon and all sorts of different you lots and lots of different um, botanicals in there we do the same thing but we use techniques that come from my background as a chef uh, it comes from a little bit from perfumery and a little bit from distilling and it's um it's based around the idea of making, if you if you understand the product like rose water or uh, orange blossom water that we use in a culinary way, um, we use, um, we, we actually make it in a very similar way to that. But it's designed to be drink, drunk either with tonic, so not never on its own, it doesn't, it doesn't work on its own, it definitely needs a, a mixer. Um, so it goes very well with tonic, produces a, an actual sort of gin and tonic substitute, although, we don't. We never try to sort of make it a gin. It is gin-like, uh, and it wins lots of awards for being, um, you know, an alcohol-free gin. Um, but it also works very well if you if you don't like tonic with with other uh, mixers. Uh, it makes a, a great um, sort of mule-type drink if you put uh, ginger ale in it. Um, and lots of people around the country, restaurants and uh, bars, are using it in cocktails. Um, so uh, when they want those botanical flavors, um, they use our drink instead of a, an alcoholic substitute in order to create a, a great tasting and grown up uh, alcohol free drink. The whole industry at the moment um, is looking, there seems to be a reduction in people wanting to drink uh, alcohol, as much alcohol anyway. And, um, and I think We've created drinks which give you a feeling of luxury, even though you're not drinking alcohol. And sometimes it's been very difficult to find something luxurious and celebratory um, that isn't alcohol. We tend to sort of think about popping the champagne or, you know, having a nice glass of whiskey or something uh, when we're celebrating. And um, somebody said the line to me once, why should we give um, alcohol ownership of celebration? And I kind of think, yeah, I kind of understand that. I, I drink alcohol and I drink non-alcoholic drinks. I drink both. But um, so many times in your life, you want something delicious. You want something luxurious. But because of time, place, what you're doing the next morning, illness, whatever those things are, you can't have that that alcoholic drink. So you still want to feel like you're celebrating. So that is what we aim to produce. And um, and, and we we do that through... As I say, distillation uh, is the main thing. We use a very traditional copper pot still. Uh, well, three we have. Um, and um, we use good old Yorkshire water and very, very good quality organic fair trade herbs. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a distillation and maceration process. Um, the exact method we keep quite close to our chest because when we first... <laughs> When we first did it, um, we took some to uh, some distillers we knew and they said, how the hell have you just done that? And so we thought, right, and OK, we're not going to tell anyone how we just did that, because clearly distillers who are used to distilling with alcohol haven't haven't quite worked out how to do it. So we, we keep it fairly close to our chest. But it's about using very traditional methods, along with um, some more up to date um, technology as well. But 
yeah, we have these beautiful three large pot stills which were hand beaten by a man in uh, in Portugal. He's about 70 years old. And when I was chasing the owner of the company for my delivery, uh, he said, I didn't know at the time this guy was 70. When you've got to understand the guy beating this out of a large sheet of copper is 70. He kind of just goes as fast as he goes. <laughs> I was like, right, okay, I understand. So we didn't chase it any longer. But yeah, we have three stills. The first still is named after my great uh, grandfather. who was called Ebenezer. And um, Ebenezer was a part of the temperance movement. And um, he, uh, yeah, he definitely decried the use of alcohol. So I thought he'd be very proud um, to have an alcohol free still named after him. <laughs> So he's called Ebenezer. The second one's called Edith for Rose's grandmother, who was the person who uh, inspired Rose to learn about plants. And uh, and so probably Bax Botanics would never eat or taste the world, never exist without Edith. And the last one is called Hefzibar because she was Ebenezer's mom and she's just got a very cool name. So we called it Hefzibar. <laughs> excellent. excellent. I, I know, I know um, stills get named because I've come across this before. So you've got a top secret recipe like Coca-Cola or uh, the Colonel's Five Spices at KFC. Uh, top secret. Um, how do you then get it out to bars and retail and, and, and restaurants and stuff like that? Because that's a completely different skill set. Yes. And this is this is what we found out. <laughs> <laughs> we were very naive uh, to, to, to begin with. Um, we're very naive. Uh, and we thought, you know, we've got a great product. We've got a great story. You know, we'll give this product to people and they go, wow, you know, we love it. Let's buy it. And um, and so, um, yeah, we were very naive about that. And I think, you know, looking back, that was that was something that we could have done, uh, you know, an awful lot better at the beginning. Um, but actually, early on, we uh, we came across some really great people and um so within two months of us launching, we were in um, New World Trading, which owns The Botanist. Uh, um, so that was a national account with a cocktail bars around the country. And we were in Booth Supermarket. And actually, after two months, we thought, oh, this is quite easy. You know, we're like, you know, it's, uh, it's all going great. We've got, you know, we've got a small supermarket. We've got a chain of bars. Um, we've got, uh, we do direct customer through a website. So, and, and that was, that was going pretty well through social media and, uh, yeah, it all, all was going swimmingly. And then we came across, uh, then the hurdles that is sort of distribution. And I, the, the biggest hurdle we ever had to, and one that we still continuously have to work hard at it is the, the actual route to market. Um, we do have a great product. We, um, you know, it, it wins lots of awards um, and uh, people love it. But actually getting liquid on lips and getting sales is definitely the hardest, hardest thing, particularly within the, the, the British drinks industry, which is notorious for being difficult to get into. Um, and that's all what we've learned uh, from various different people uh, over the years. Um, but um, yeah, that was that. That's the biggest challenge always for a small manufacturer trying to compete with the marketing power and the um, the sales power of people like Diageo and you know Perno Ricard and all those guys. Um, what we have found is that we need to. I think we were trying to compete with them directly, naively in the beginning, but now we've realised we've got to find our own niche and our product is different to theirs. Our product is just like your artisan gin. It can be an incredibly successful business, but it's not going to be Gordon's. And so um, we have just sort of realigned who we now sell to. Um, we go very much, although we still do direct to customer, both direct to business customer and direct to end user, um, we find that... Um, the smaller, more discerning um, wholesaler, whether it be in the UK or abroad, is where we need to be because people, there is a certain market for those products where uh, they're incredibly authentic, they're made in a really traditional way, um, 
the company has, you know, excellent values as far as sustainability and authenticity go. And so um, what we've learned over the, the years is to find those uh, oh, that find those um, find those people who really appreciate the product and want something which is discerning and authentic uh, and and small batch, you know. And I think you can have an incredibly successful business at that size, and we don't need to try and be Seedlip, who's the market leader, or Liars, who is you know world dominating within the alcohol free spirit scene. Um, we can't compete with them because our model is very much we grow organically. Um, we we see um, making a profit as important uh, rather than just building brand. Um, and, and that's the, the route we've chosen. So, uh, yeah, um, I think now we have found, though, that our market and found those key wholesalers, which then have a sales team that can go out and, and they're equipped and um, and skilled in sales we're, we're not we're creative people um, and we love our products and we're passionate about our products but finding great sales teams from wholesalers is is invaluable right so you so you pass your product onto the wholesaler and then they use their distribution network to get it to those discerning retailers that that you're trying to target yeah the discerning retailers but also hospitality um uh, hospitality is a is a key part of, of any drinks business. Um, people who go into a bar and drink a cocktail with your drink in it will then be inspired to walk into a supermarket or a retailer or a, you know, a farm shop and buy it again um, because they'll have tasted it and they can taste it in a, in a single shot in a cocktail or in a Bax and tonic. And, um, and then if they love it, we have a lot of customers then who will, hit us on the website and buy direct from us as well as buy, you know, uh, buying it in cocktails when they go out. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think finding those key wholesalers uh, is the, is the key. Um, our biggest, our biggest coup really is we teamed up with a distributor in the Middle East and they're almost certainly going to be our biggest customer in the next 12 months. Right. And that, that leads us perfectly. Slinky link there, Chris. I saw what you did there. <laughs> that takes us to your how-to. So, Chris, what's your how-to today? Uh, my how-to today is, is really um, trying to um, explain a little bit about how people shouldn't be afraid of, of export, particularly as a small business. You know, we're a small business. Um, sometimes it feels incredibly daunting. But what I would say is that there are... Um, there are people out there who can help. And the biggest form of help that we've had is from the Department of International Trade. And they have international trade advisors in all different uh, business areas. Um, we have a Michelle Cooper, who's for our area, has helped me immeasurably with um, um, the technical side of exports um, and plus introducing me to, to some incredible people who can advise me. Um, the other thing that I think is, is well worth getting involved with is the um, Chamber of Trade, because the Chamber of Trade, again, have huge resources to, um, to allow people to export. They will create the export paperwork with you and help you along with that. Um, so I think the, the, the big thing I would say is don't be afraid of it. If, if you get the opportunity to deal with someone abroad, it is not as daunting as it first appears to uh, to actually get products out there. Um, the biggest, our biggest uh, issue going into was was going into uh, America um, because of the FDA. Their their rules and regs are confounding to you know even experts in America. But um, uh, again, there are people there, uh, people within um, the Department of International Trade who. Um, we'll give you free advice. Uh, Department of International Trade have um, co-funded a trip out to the States to, to um, um, promote our products. And um, yeah, I think the, 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 the biggest thing is there is, there is free advice there. There is um, uh, grant funding to actually help you export. And, and my biggest piece of advice on how to export as a small business would be Contact your local train, chamber of trade and talk to them and talk talk to your find out who your local Department of International Trade 
um, trade advisor is and, and, and get them on the phone. Um, they couldn't be more helpful for us. They've been amazing. They've, they've opened the business in America and they've opened the business in, in the Middle East for us. That's fantastic. That is brilliant, actually brilliant advice for anybody who wants to look into exporting abroad. And with that, that's a big thank you to Chris Bax. What a fascinating story. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found it interesting, inspiring and of use. To make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes, please subscribe to the show. Go on, do it now. Do it now before you go off and do something else. Thank you, much appreciated. Oh, and don't forget our fair deal. See you next week.